Northport joining us now is the MP Jonathan Goulis, who represents Stoke-on-Trent North. Jonathan, it's great to have you on the programme. Welcome aboard. Your first time on Crosstalk. Uh, we've been wanting you for a while, by the way. Um, Rwanda, let's start off with that. Big vote tomorrow. It's become the typical tug of war between the two opposing wings of the Conservative Party. Uh, are you the, the rope in the middle or do you come down on one side or the other? Well, look, I've been proud to be working with Danny Kruger, Miriam Kate, Simon Clark, John Hayes, Bill Cash, Robert Jenrick, Ansuela Braverman, just to name a few, in drafting and laying these amendments and urging colleagues to support them. And we're delighted that we've now got over 60 colleagues who have signed up to these amendments. And we hope that the Prime Minister will do the right thing, which is listen to a large chunk of this Conservative Party that's clearly sending him a message that the bill, as it's currently drafted, is better than the status quo. But we need to make sure that every legal loophole is shut off hot otherwise We'll see the system backed up again, people taking months or years, not days, in order to be deported, and fundamentally undermine our ability to control our borders, which will be damaging when it comes to the general election in the future, particularly if we have an election in the latter half of this year, where this policy, as drafted presently, would therefore be tested. And if it fails, our third attempt, let's not forget, in three years, then it will be three strikes and you're out. Um, we're going to get onto the BBC in just a minute and your friend uh, Gary Lineker, Jonathan, but um, let's just stick with Rwanda at the moment, or not just Rwanda. I mean, you saw the front of the Telegraph today, the poll predicting, uh, you know, annihilation at the next polls, and then the piece underneath it by the man who's responsible for the poll, uh, Lord David Frost, a big beast of your party, saying that, I think, what, summing up what he's saying is this that the people who voted for the Tories, and particularly the Red Wall voters, the ones who thought the Tories would deliver Brexit, what they voted for, they're not feeling they're getting what uh, they thought they were going to get. The cost of living, uh, you know, the Tories keep saying, oh, we're going to sort this out. And then you hear... Uh, the Prime Minister saying, yeah, but we've got to get to carbon net zero, so we're going to carry on charging you for that. People aren't going to buy that. Uh, plus, I think the whole Brexit message, there's this feeling, you know, Rishi has brought in, you know, arch remainers like Jeremy Hunt, now Lord Cameron, to his... Uh, cabinet and people thought, well, you were supposed to be the Brexit cabinet. How about talking up the advantages of Brexit rather than wallowing in the alleged disadvantages? All of that means that people feel they voted for a party, the Conservative Party, and didn't get a Conservative Party. Do you see what I'm saying? Look, Kevin, look, I think you raised some very fair questions. In 2016, when this country voted to leave the European Union, it was asking for a radical shape of our politics, moving away from the centrism that was just about tinkering and technocratic uh, changes rather, and actually wanted instead radical reform. We saw that, therefore, play out in the 2019 general election. But actually, we saw that early, and Alex was one of those who was elected to the European Parliament overwhelmingly by this nation because they were sending a very clear message that they want their leaders to deliver on the promises they make but also want the radical shake-up. And, of course, at that time with uh, the Brexit Party, a deal was done to enable people like me to have the opportunity to run and unopposed as well on the right so that we could challenge the orthodoxy. And I feel like people like myself are fighting from within sometimes. It can be very frustrating. Uh, I certainly think that, you know, I would like to have just done a lot more radical stuff and bolder stuff in our time. But, of course, we have to accept there was a pandemic, which would have uh, taken a lot of government time, as we know, as well as a cost of living crisis, where the government did offer hundreds of billions of pounds worth of support, uh, when you add in total the coronavirus support as well, to make sure that people have help with their fuel bills, obviously those on universal credit are getting the support they need. But don't get me wrong, I'm not shy away from the fact that we could have gone harder and further and made the most of Brexit, something I firmly believe in and want to see the Brexit bonus uh, be counted for when it comes uh, to future generations. And I do fear that with Sir Keir Starmer, someone, as we know, is an arch remainer, someone who wanted a so-called people's vote and to overturn the will of the British people, that if we allow him to walk into Downing Street, we'll just see real uh, a, a dynamic alignment, as he puts it, a.k.a. copying and pasting, which we know Rachel Reeves is a big fan of, uh, of uh, EU regulations and rules. That means we're all but in the European Union.
Uh, the sad fact is, though, isn't it, Jonathan, that basically you represent a constituency of people who for a long time have felt their democratic voice wasn't heard, the left behinds, the Brexiteers, the patriots, who want the sort of politics that you want to deliver, who want the sort of politics that I want to deliver. We represent different parties, and yet it's the left wing of your party, the Conservative Party, the ones least likely to lose their seats, actually, behind the blue wall, who are the ones preventing that huge voting bloc, the most most important block to either the Conservative Party or the Labour Party from being properly represented. Would it not be better if people like you turn around and said the Conservative Party is basically beyond redemption at this point and essentially come and join a party like Reform that does share your ideology? <laughs> I'll tell you what, Alex, I appreciate the attempt of reaching out there to get me to walk the floor, but it's not going to happen because I'm a firm believer of the Conservative Party and believe that people like myself need to fight from within. And I would urge the fact that with that opinion poll that we saw this morning on the front of the Telegraph, that 94 seats will be lost because of the reform vote that will be given. So it is fair to argue that a vote for reform will allow uh, Labour MPs into seats like mine. I'm afraid and to it say, means, you government you you disproved it. it. You government well, disproved Alex, will, that and said that isn't and, what and, the and poll what, says at all. Well, what, what I will say, Alex, is if you look at the Stoke on Trent North in this poll, if you had the Conservative vote and reform vote, Labour would lose and I would win. Now, I'm a, I would like to think, a, a decent a Conservative, the type of the reform and I, I think, share lots of values in most areas, apart from, obviously, maybe things like proportional representation. If you take people like me out, then how can the Conservative Party ever really be the party that we all both hope uh, it should be and would be uh, if we allow it to be controlled by this One Nation agenda, which, sadly, has become a, a new term for basically centrism, a new term for globalism, a new term for allowing international law to trump the sovereignty of our parliament, as well as trumping our ability to control our borders and our laws, because obviously it looks to trying to be some sort of global leader when other countries like France are simply ignoring what Strasbourg is saying by deporting yeah. very recently yeah. someone they suspected was a terrorist to Uzbekistan, even though the Strasbourg court said they couldn't. We need to get much more muscular. You know, that's why I was glad to see Grant Schaps prepared to deploy 20,000, I think it was, troops into Eastern Europe in order to make it very clear to Vladimir Putin that we will have Ukraine's back, but also that we will not cowl and, uh, sorry, uh, not cower to uh, these dictators, these rogue dictators that we've sadly have been allowed to all for too long to get away with murder. Quite yeah, literally. you're so right. I mean, uh, we're about the only nation in Europe that pays any attention to the ECHR. <laughs> all the others just go, yeah, yeah, thanks, and then they just ignore them. But we obey them implicitly, and something should be done about that. Perhaps leave the ECHR. How about that? Absolutely. Uh, let's move on to uh, the BBC, though. An exclusive talk TV story today, Jonathan, revealing that uh, the, the state broadcaster, still outrageously in my view, is prosecuting 130 people a day for not paying their TV licences. That anachronism, I think, has to stop. Before we get to that, let's talk about your old friend Gary Lineker. He's at it again, social media warrior that he is. He's now uh, retweeted a, a tweet on X uh, suggesting or demanding that Israel uh, is kicked out of all future international football competitions. And this is uh, by order of the Palestinian FA. Gary thinks, quite right, Israel shouldn't be able to play football anymore. Uh, once again, you see, they say he's a sports presenter. He can... OK, under our new rules, you can tweet your political opinions, Gary. Well, this is... He's a sports presenter. This is sports politics right at the centre of sports politics, a really important issue. And I would suggest that is a real abuse of his position as the BBC's leading sports presenter to, to get behind a tweet kicking, suggesting that Israel is kicked out of international football. Not right, once again. Well, Kevin, I don't recall Gary Lineker demanding Russia withdraw from World Cup when they invaded Ukraine. I don't recall Gary Lineker... Uh, uh, demanding China not allowed to play football because of the this awful discrimination against Muslims that are taking place, two million in concentration camps. I don't recall Gary Lineker actually saying anything on October 7th regarding the mass murder and terrorist atrocities taken uh, done by Hamas against the Israeli Jewish people. I don't recall Gary Lineker at that time even demanding the uh, release of the hostages, over 200 that we know were taken. I don't recall Gary Lineker saying that Hamas, as we have seen, on video footage are sealing aid, are using uh, innocent Gazans as human shields. 
are actually uh, throwing LGBT plus people off at the top of buildings because they do, do not think it aligns with their views and their values or their faith. You know, this is ultimately Gary Lineker once again jumping on the social media bandwagon for cheap likes without actually having any understanding of the organisations that he's talking about or the impact it would have on his or his words have when it comes to being a Jewish resident in this country. So I think that Gary Lineker is an abomination to the BBC, is a disgrace to sports presenting because he doesn't talk about football, he talks about politics, and ultimately should do the right thing, which is to step down and move away and find another broadcaster. Maybe like the ones in, uh, was it Qatar he went Qatar, to? Yeah. Um, Qatar, right, right yeah. Yeah, he, he, he was happy to pocket the money over in Qatar and didn't raise any human rights violations then, but was happy to talk about it, I think, when he came back to the UK after the World Cup. So it's amazing what a bit of coin can do for some people. Quick final Indeed. word, Jonathan, if you can. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, Talk TV has uh, unearthed the fact that the BBC still prosecuting 130 people a day. As I said uh, earlier, not so long ago, uh, one in every 10 courtroom prosecutions was by the BBC prosecuting people for not paying their licence. In the old days, some would even go to jail. This anachronism, this prosecuting of people, you know, who haven't paid their little uh, licence fee for watching Strictly Come Dancing or something, I just think it's bizarre bizarre, absurd, and it has to stop, doesn't it? Yeah, but it's ridiculous that in 2024, people have a teletax. No other country, major economy in the world, taxes people in order to watch other channels, let alone the actual BBC itself. It's just utterly disgraceful. We saw, in fact, the chairman of the Conservative Party, a constituent of his in North West Durham, was even taken to court, despite the fact she outlined a wider range of learning needs and other uh, financial situations that she found herself in. So I hope to hear his voice joined the call in Cabinet. It's time to bin the licence fee once and for all and let the BBC stand at its own two feet, just like Talk TV and other broadcasters mm. have to do, because it's about time the BBC realised that they're not some, they're no longer the luxury Rolls Royce option. There's a whole plethora of options out there, and young people are voting with their feet. They're not choosing to watch the BBC like they used to, and so the BBC needs to face up to that reality. Jonathan, Jonathan Gullis, so uh, Gullis for Prime Minister, I say. Oh, do you know, Always a pleasure, mate. Always a pleasure. An interview with Jonathan's like reading the Reform it's Manifesto. It is. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, it is. I know that. I know that manifesto well. Uh,